they're lost, perhaps because there's so much information. They're not sure how to organize the chapter. They're not sure what information to put in there, what references to apply, which ones not to apply. What I want to be able to do is give you these tips and strategies to help you develop your work, perhaps that outline quicker, and then all you have to do is write to that outline of the major headings and subheadings that you developed. I want to give you what I believe to be a sound approach. This is the same approach I used when I were, went through my dissertation. It's the same approach that I believe is sound and systematic that I share with my mentees and how I have them go through their work when they're writing a qualitative dissertation. The sound approach is proven. I believe if you have the approach and you understand the tips, that's going to be far easier for you to put your chapter two together and after all. That's the purpose of this program, is to help you get through your work easier. I want to emphasize the importance of the content, the content that you're going to put in Chapter 2. I personally believe that Chapter 2 is the most important chapter of your entire proposal and dissertation. It's pretty easy in general to write Chapter 1. It's not too hard to write Chapter 3 because all you're describing is how you're going to do your research. That would be two of the three chapters in your proposal to include then this one to have three chapters. Now, if you're doing your dissertation, you're adding on chapters four and five. Chapter four is merely stating to the audience what data you found. In chapter five, you're just merely writing the implications and conclusions. Matter of fact, I believe that chapter five is the easiest chapter to write, as is chapter four, pretty darn easy. But the most complex chapter to write is chapter two. And you have to realize that this is your story. The power that you're going to put into your work, whether you use those tools that I talked about, the timeline and the mind map, and how you craft your chapter is critical. It's something nobody else is going to be able to write. It's something that nobody else will find all the same references you found if they go at it on their own. You get to put in your lived experiences. You get to put in your views and your synthesis of all the information. From the synthesis, you're going to make an analysis and you're going to make an evaluation of all the content. You're going to let the reader know what information is out there, what gaps in the literature you found, and the importance of the body of knowledge and the contribution that you're going to make in your study. So if you don't believe in this chapter, it's going to be hard for you to be able to write something that's really significant, substantial. Now, I'll be honest with you, I believe, and sometimes I am of the same way when I'm reading the work, perhaps as a dissertation chair, that I don't spend as much time in chapter two as I do the other chapters. After all, your work is actually first and foremost a research study, so we have to make sure the research is more important. And for many who are not researchers, they sometimes struggle with being able to write chapters 1, 3, 4, and 5 in a manner that reflects the research context. But chapter 2, without a doubt, is the most important from the author's perspective, and I believe of the perspective later when somebody reads your work. And more on that as we go through this lesson. I believe that part of the purpose of this lesson is to set an image for you. That if you can get an image in your mind about what chapter 2 could look like, it's easier for you then to create it. It's much like when you get a vision or a dream. Once you take that vision in a dream, you start writing it down and you start creating some goals and objectives and some initiatives. You can literally live that dream. You can live that vision. Once I help you understand perhaps better how you can use tools like the mind map and you can use the tool of the timeline, you can see how these can generate the outline for you. And once you use that information to generate your outline, then all you have to do is write to that outline, whether it be starting with the major headings and then moving to subheadings and moving from one area to another within the chapter of the content that you're going to write. So let's get that image in your mind of creating a truly interesting, significant, substantial story and how to do that. And you will be able to actually do that and move forward. Now, the first of these 16 tips and strategies is first as a reminder that all you're really doing is reviewing what's already been published. You don't have to publish anything at this point. You're just going to review all the published works that other people have put together. Now, you may end up reviewing hundreds of articles, maybe even thousands of articles and books and reports while you're doing your work. 
and using only 10 percent of those that's not uncommon to have roughly a hundred different articles and different books and resources that you cite in your work and have looked at over a thousand important point is that once you get the idea of how you're going to design your work as you're reviewing what's already been published you start to then sift through what fits and what doesn't fit and as you start to look at different articles you'll see that they either align with their, what you're writing about or they don't and so this is often one of the reasons why early on it's important to come up with your outline for chapter two it makes the review of the literature so much easier because it becomes more focused for you but in essence all you're really doing is reviewing what's already been written and published and you're going to then create your story around that information as you write chapter two be conscious of gaps in the literature if you see areas where people have not written about as much as you believe they should particularly if they're related to the problem that you've identified in the problem statement you want to be able to see that there's some information or gaps that just haven't been addressed yet and perhaps that's why there's a problem that you're exploring and you're trying to get more information about through your qualitative research dissertation if you put together a timeline and if you put together that mind map that I discussed in those individual lessons in this program, you may see gaps in the literature emerging easily or perhaps more easy than you would otherwise because as you look at a timeline and you see different correlations or different causality things that have happened with critical factors in history and you start to look at the literature and who's produced what models, oftentimes it's easier to understand the difference of the gaps when you see them. Sometimes people overlook the gaps as just, well, it wasn't important. Well, we still have problems today with leaders doing extremely well holistically around the world. We know there's problems in the body of knowledge and leadership because, after all, if we had the perfect model, we wouldn't have as many problems as we have. So identifying the gap that you see could be crucial in helping other people become even better leaders. As you look at writing chapter two, I want you to be mindful of writing about both similar and divergent views. It's very easy to find a lot of authors who write about the same thing or believe in the same school of thought. Perhaps a lot of people like situational leadership or they believe in the same approach to teaching children in grade school or in nursing. There are many people who have some of the same philosophies on how nurses should be trained. What often is missing, particularly early on in doctoral students in the first and second year of their educational program in the doctorate degree that they're working on is showing the divergent views and it's often when you find the divergent views and you compare them to what everybody else is believing is where you find a difference this is where you may actually find a gap in the literature because it's often the divergent views when we read them and we consider them and then we do it in an objective manner that we begin to ask different questions and often from those different questions we're able to see gaps in the literature or we're able to see different points of view that were never considered. I can pretty much assure you that for every body of knowledge there are divergent views. I mean remember for a long time people thought the world was flat yet a divergent view happened and then all of a sudden that body of knowledge changed completely. It's not uncommon that that happens in your world. And that could also mean that divergent views are looked at and how businesses have changed based on the 2008-2009 financial and economic crisis that was predominantly found in the United States but yet felt elsewhere. There are similar views on why that happened. There's also divergent views on why that happened. And now we see that businesses are conducted differently. Oftentimes it's these divergent views and the differences between the similar views of the other side of the body of knowledge that people believe in which opens up some great ideas for you to write about. So as you go through your literature and you're considering what to put in your work, pay particular attention to those divergent views and I think when you find those you're going to start to see that you learn a lot more about the body of knowledge that you're studying. 
think about your chapter two in the sense that it's going to frame or it frames the problem based on the available literature. Now, oftentimes one creates a problem statement and then once the problem statement is put together, they move on to creating a purpose statement and then start looking in the literature for more information to be able to create the body of knowledge around that problem to relate to your particular study. If you have a well-developed chapter two, somebody should be able to read chapter two and almost inherently have a sense for what your general and specific problems are that you alluded to in chapter one that have generated basically your research questions. Think about chapter two as an alignment to the problem statements that you have put together in chapter one and vice versa. Oftentimes when I look at a proposal, I will read chapter two first. And then in my mind, I should already have the ability to conceive something of what I'm going to read about in chapter one as it relates to the problem. Because after all, chapter two is all the literature related to the problem in chapter one. Oftentimes it adds more information as well. But if the focus is on K through 12 and how teachers prepare students for college, there should be a lot of information in chapter two about different methods, different strategies, different models that have come and gone over the years. And I should walk away with the sense that there is a concern on how we educate our youth to prepare them for college. The fifth one of the 16 tips and strategies I want to share here now is that you're going to provide a critical literature review. This doesn't mean you're going to be critical about the sources, about whether who's a better writer, who's not a better writer, who's more foremost expert. It's that you're going to apply critical thinking, that you're going to move beyond just reviewing of the literature, and you're going to get into some of the comparisons and contrasts. This may be where you start looking at similar and divergent views. Then you're going to look beyond that even and look at all the information that you've put into and consider it a synthesis that as you put it all together after you have much of your information written already is that this synthesis is going to produce an output the output then you will analyze that output and then you will evaluate that output as you look to increase the higher order or perhaps high advanced areas critical thinking skills what we're looking for you to do is be able to discern more and reflect upon what you've read and provide your analysis and your evaluation. This is where the story becomes your own because if I read the same literature, I would probably see that synthesis a little bit different based on my own lived experiences and my own particular philosophies. And while I may be just as objective as you, it's still going to be a little bit different. As you look to review the literature. What we're really looking for, I believe, as dissertation chairs and committee members is an essence of higher order critical thinking skills. If you're not sure what higher order critical thinking skills are, I encourage you now is a good time after this lesson to go online into perhaps Google Scholar and put in there higher order critical thinking skills and do a little review of the literature and inform yourself. Become a better consumer of critical thinking and when you do this is where the power comes into your work all too often students early on as I mentioned they just get focused on doing a review of the literature and say basically article reviews that's not what this is about sure there is some information about that in there but we have to move beyond just reviewing individual sources and stringing citations together such as quotes and paraphrases to be able to come up with something that's far more than those string of quotes so as you look to your work remember critical literature review and this is where your work will really stand out and be significant substantial as you notice, I talk about significant, substantial all the time because literally if your dissertation is not significant, substantial, why are you doing it? Who is it going to help? Let's take a look at what that really means, significant, substantial, and you'll start to build it into your work. The next tip that I want to share with you is about the collection of materials on a topic that as you start to look at your work, you're providing this collection of materials on topics could be concepts as well. Now, in a quantitative dissertation, 
we start to see a collection of materials more so focused on the dependent independent variables because that is the boundaries if you will of what a chapter two is written upon and based upon is the dependent independent variables in a qualitative dissertation because there are no variables you're going to be writing your material on more so topics maybe even themes and it could be even people perhaps the different types of stakeholders that you're going to be interviewing during your open-ended interview questions if that's what you might be doing to gain insights or lived experiences of people that were involved in the area of your study as you start to look at different topics this is where I believe that a good mind map comes in handy I believe a mind map in a qualitative dissertation provides even more value than a quantitative because once you get into the quantitative and you have your dependent independent variables figured out it's not as abstract it's far more linear that way here you're talking about abstract concepts perhaps more from a conceptual point of view and when you start to identify the different topics and show how they are related or interrelated to one another it makes it easier for you then to create that outline and then write the outline into a chapter two logical but yet personal story I always talk about chapter two as a personal story that this is going to be your personal story and this could be logical once you get these topics or you have the themes that you're going to write about you're going to structure them in a manner that flows for example if you're going to do interviews of nurses and find out why there's nurse burnout happening at increased and alarming rates well there's a logical progression of how nurses are trained and how they're supervised how much work they're given who are involved in those processes such as other senior nurses doctors physicians staff members and we start to see that there's some logical progression to see where nurses are at today and why they're burnt out and there's a lot of information that's available not only about that but about how many people are coming into the hospitals based on generations we start to see that there's far more baby boomers entering the hospitals and healthcare systems than ever before and so as you start to write about one of the things that deal with nursing burnout you will have to address the increased population that's going into the hospital when there's more patients you need more nurses if you don't have more enough nurses then the nurses that you have there are far more stretched and tend to burn out or become overstressed out and can't do their jobs well so think about the logical progression as you're writing your chapter and as you're putting your personal story together you may see the body of knowledge a little bit different than I do that's okay but make some logical connections I think if you do that early on in chapter two it makes the rest of it flow extremely well because you inform the reader much like an introduction of what will follow then you provide it and then you just do a conclusion at the end so look at your work perhaps to be in some sort of logical yet personal story that comes out through your work now the eighth one is information based on your research design dictates how your chapter is going to be written if you're doing a qualitative case study the design of your chapter two is going to be a little bit different than the design of a qualitative phenomenological study for example there are two different types of studies in a case study you're looking for a robust views from many different stakeholders and so therefore that design is going to be related about different stakeholders beliefs their own values their own perceptions their own experiences and they're going to be varied whereas in a phenomenological study you're going to look at the situation of the problem through a very narrow scope for example if you're going to do a qualitative case study on how and why there are problems related to children coming out of high school who are not prepared for college that case study design you would be perhaps interviewing the teachers you would be interviewing the principals the administrative staff perhaps those at the superintendent level perhaps even some parents to gain a sense of what's going on and what's working well and what's not working well but in a phenomenological study it's more of a narrow focus and so therefore you may only be interviewing principals to find out what principals believe 
based on their lived experiences on what their assumptions are, their beliefs, their values, their perceptions. And you may be interviewing 20 different principals of high schools in New York State. Now, that's completely different than the case study. So therefore, the research design dictates how you're going to write your chapter, how you're going to design your chapter. If you're going to do a case study, I encourage you, again, to go to ProQuest Dissertations and look up qualitative case studies and see how other people perhaps have structured their work. Same as with an ophthalmological study or an ontological study, whatever research design you're using, look and see how a few other people who have graduated and had their work published at your university suggest to you how you might consider writing your own. There's nothing wrong with emulating other people's work. But it is important that you understand that your research design dictates has some structure guidelines for how you put together chapter two. The sooner you realize that, the easier it's going to be for you to structure chapter two in regards to an outline. And it makes it so much easier that when you think of these things up front instead of thinking about it later after you've already written 15 or 20 pages. Now, tip number nine of the 16 tips and strategies is to suggest that you should have about five to seven pages per item. For example, in that qualitative case study where I mentioned about adolescents going into the college system not fully prepared. If you're going to do interviews of teachers and administrators, superintendents and parents, you'd write about five to seven pages per each of those different stakeholders. You'd give about their background, how their beliefs and their perceptions came to be, how, imp how much input they have. If you're writing about the parents, you may have some indication of a historical ty type of trending information, how over time more families have been and becoming more so single family homes and there may be some type of relationships between single family homes and students not being prepared for college when they graduate because there's not that two parent structure system where they have more time with their parents to help them or for whatever reasons are being caused by parents potentially having an impact on students their children not being better prepared for college. You may also provide some information about teachers and how they're trained that perhaps now more than ever before because on the situation in the population and the makeup of teachers maybe now there's far more teachers with less experience than ever before and that contributes something somehow some way to the students not being prepared. Of course you have to show those relationships or in their relationships but you can start to see when you start writing to these different types of stakeholders through about five or seven pages each that you start to build your chapter one stakeholder at a time. If you're starting to do something in the sense of a phenomenological study, you're going to write more than five pages on just the teachers or in the example I said before about the superintendents, but you're going to write more about perhaps five pages about the superintendents training and education. Maybe another one might be on their on their common perceptions or their common beliefs or common alignments with different models. And as you start to see each one of those areas are separate things that you can create five to seven pages about. Once you start to look at these concepts or these topics that you're going to write about in chapter two and you structure them in a logical flow, you can start to put some page numbers to them. So if you had four different areas and you had five to seven pages on those areas, topics or themes, all of a sudden now you have 20 to perhaps 27 pages worth of content and you start to see how quickly it builds up. And therefore you start to build the design and you start to see the image of chapter two being developed and you say, now it's easy. Now you just have to take your outline and write your content. In chapter two, for each of these areas, you're going to give some information about history and trends. For example, if you're writing about the nursing situation, how nurses are burning out, perhaps you're going to show some history on the population of people and how many are entering the healthcare system. That, as we started to see, that the baby boomers, their generations, as they traveled through history, and the trends suggest that there's more of them coming into the healthcare system than ever before. 
There's many documents and much documentation out there that suggests this to be true. You're going to show this in a historical kind of view, these trends as well. So chapter two becomes a little bit of a history lesson as well as information based on the trends that relate to each of your different concepts or topics. If you're writing about the different stakeholders of educating students, you'll perhaps give a bit of information about the history and trends of teachers, principals, parenting, and other things that you believe to be important, such as any other themes or topics that you want to include. You're going to give information about the current situation. That if you think about every one of these areas that you're going to do a brief history review of that and bring it up to current situation there now you start to see how you could quickly write five pages on any one of those items and be consistent from any item concept or theme from one to another that you show a little bit of history some trending information and what the current situation is all of a sudden if you were to write a page or two on the history a page or two on the trends a page or two on the current situation now all of a sudden you have five to seven pages for each item. I'm hoping that I'm setting an image for you that allows you to see how you can craft each area and then you start to look more so for the articles that align yourselves with the history of those topics, the history of those different themes that you're writing about, then the, any trending information and then what's going on currently today. If you use a timeline you're more than likely going to find what I believe to be critical factors or points. And these are where things pivoted in history. These critical points are where things pivoted in the body of knowledge. For example, the earth was flat. All of a sudden there was a critical point there when all of a sudden the earth was no longer perceived to be flat because somebody sailed beyond the end and didn't fall off the edge of the earth. They went around the world. And we start to see that there are these critical factors and points. When you put together a timeline, it helps you to see that. For example, I'll share with you one item here that in the United States, when World War I started in the early 1900s, the majority of the men went to work. Women came from the home and went into the work to be able to work in the factories while the men went to war. When the war was over, the majority of the women went back home to their home and became their taking care of the children and the family while the returning spouse went back to work in the factory and other places. Later, when World War II started, the same thing happened in the, in the first part where the men went to war, women went to work. When the war was over, not as many women went back home. More of them stayed in the workplace. And ever since then, things have changed on how people supervise and lead through organizational behavior, organizational psychology, human relations change, and how work was fundamentally done from that point forward changed. And that was a critical factor, perhaps a critical point in history in the United States that started things such as the women's movement, equal opportunity, all these things that were needed and rightfully so to, delayed too long but we see that these critical points and factors happen at certain points in history and time. The more you can see those and the easier it is then to include them into your work and you can start to see when you put these critical points and factors into the history and the trends of what you're writing about, your work becomes powerful. This is what often is missing in work that comes from the early drafts of chapter two is they really don't show many of these critical factors or points even though they're there. Now the next tip, tip number 13 of 16 tips and strategies is for you to remember and keep in mind as you're doing your work that you're writing your chapter around ideas and concepts not about the sources. It's not about stringing all these references together. You are writing about the ideas and the concepts and the themes and then you're supplementing you're augmenting your work with those articles and those books, those authors works that align or refute what you're writing about. All too often, 
what I see happen is that in the early stages of chapter two being developed is that my mentees would get all the information around a certain topic. Let's just say it's productivity improvement. They get all these references and they start writing to the references and they put them in order and they say, well, this is what really what this author had to say and this is what this author had to say. And then there's a quote over here and a paraphrase over there from these sources. That's not what writing chapter two is about. Chapter two is about reviewing the literature and giving your review and then you use the works that are important to go in and substantiate or refute what you're writing about. If you start to see that you're writing about what one author said as compared to the next author, I encourage you to take a look and say, are you writing about the sources and the references or are you writing about the topics and themes? Many times I'll tell my dissertation mentees, just write. Don't even include any author's work in it. Just write what you believe. For example, if you're a teacher in high school, you don't need references to know what's going on. You don't need references to support what the situation currently is. Write what it is and then go get other people's work that helps support and refute your work. If you find then after you write what you put together and you find these counter or these incongruent ideas, perhaps these divergent views, then you start to strengthen your work by including them into what you believe to be true. I know and I realize that particularly in chapter two, early on in your doctor programs, you're probably instilled, don't put anything in there without a citation. Well, they're conditioning you to writing in a very objective manner. And oftentimes we need to do that to help you understand that what we don't want are your unsubstantiated opinions, but we do want your voice. The whole idea of chapter two really is for you to display that you have heard and read the voices of what other people have put together, you've considered them and then written your own work. Now, if you think about it that way, that you've looked at all the literature, you've listened to what these authors have said, you've considered it in an objective manner. Considering it means that you've synthesized it, you have analyzed it, you have evaluated it, and then you write your own work. So if you get caught up on writing about all these different sources, I'd like you to rethink it and say, how do, can you go about it differently? Now, the 14th item of the 16 tips and strategies are these themes or issues that they connect your sources together. It's not about connecting the sources together, but as you start to look at your mind map, you start to look at your timeline, that the themes or issues that you're writing about, they're actually connecting the sources together you can actually start to see how one author's work helped somebody else's work. In the sense of quality management, we see what happens today at a fast food restaurant like McDonald's. The themes and the issues that connect all the work between Frederick Taylor and where we're at today are the things about time motion studies, the themes or the issues related to productivity on how to improve processes, how to improve efficiency, how to become more effective from not only the people perspective, but also of the processes themselves. These are the themes, these are the issues. And it becomes less about Dr. Deming's work, it becomes less about Frederick Taylor's work, it becomes less about Dr. Duran's work, and anybody else since then, it becomes more about the themes and the issues. It just so happens that you're using the masters and the works of others to bring these themes and these issues to be what's important. There's a couple different approaches you might look at. Are you writing from a thematic approach or a methodical approach? Oftentimes, I find this to be true. Not always, nothing's 100%, nothing's absolute, but oftentimes in a qualitative study, people are writing more about themes, more issues, more abstract types of concepts, where perhaps in a quantitative dissertation, they're writing more about a methodical approach. But you could still have a methodical approach if you're writing about a theoretical based type of dissertation that you're working on as compared to something that's more concepts and more abstract, if you will. Now, what's the difference between one? I, I believe that you start to look at thematic, you're starting to see these themes, these issues that are running through your work. That means that perhaps as you start to write about the different ways that we're educating people, we see different themes that have emerged through all the different stakeholders that were involved. And so therefore, this theme comes out within the work and within your writing. 
and perhaps more the methodical approach is is how people are actually trained and what they actually do and how they are actually perceived in in a manner that's producing the same type of train of thought now if you're not sure what thermatic or methodical approaches are I encourage you to explore this a little bit more spend a little bit more time in this or any area that I'm talking about because teaching you and training about each one of these individually I can't do in this type of lesson program but what I'm doing is at least opening your eyes a little bit more to say how could you do your work better maybe you need to go and find out a little bit more information about higher order critical thinking skills as I mentioned before maybe here now you need to go into Google Scholar and type in thematic approach or methodical approach and what you can do easily is what is a thematic approach to writing a literature review put that as a question in Google remember in Google more times than not you're gonna find better results in the searches by asking a question than just putting in thermatic approach and that's because it's designed really to produce information that way first than any other way at least that's my belief and I always find I get richer findings when I ask a question in Google or any search engine but particularly Google and if you haven't used Google Scholar yet Go into Google and just Google Google Scholar, googlescholar.com, and you'll find that you'll find far more references there that you can actually use in your own work. At the foundation, when you're writing Chapter 2, I want you to keep two things in mind, both breadth and depth of topic knowledge. You have to help the reader to understand, first, that you are the subject matter expert, and that you have a breadth and depth of knowledge. Breadth and depth means that you have explored the whole scope from A to Z, if you will, or the historical view. You understand the history behind it. You understand, perhaps, the relationships and interrelationships of your work. Breadth and depth is easy to relate to. Perhaps if you're talking about literature related to leadership. Well, you should ideally give some information in your chapter too about where leadership theories came from. Maybe you're going to talk about Greek philosophers. Maybe you're going to give some insights about the great man theory and then how leadership started shifting in the early 1900s once we started to move away from pure agriculture and we started to move into having the assembly line and how leadership changed once there were more women in the workplace, once more equal rights came on in the 60s and, and 70s in, in, the, in the United States. And we start to see how these trends started changing and and then you go into perhaps now that may suggest a breath now you go into more in depth and you go into one area and you, and you drill down deep perhaps it's in two different leadership styles and or the differences in the convergent and different views about situational leadership or transformational leadership as you start to build your breath in depth you'll start to realize that you're creating this body of knowledge in your own work and in your own mind. And when others read it, they should walk away with the sense that your chapter two reflects well upon you, that you were an expert, you are the expert at the time of the writing and when it was published, and that you are a wealth of information and you have a breadth and depth of that content knowledge. It's important that you understand in your chapter two to be able to display that at the end oftentimes you may not be able to see it within your own work and so therefore you may need your dissertation committee members to be able to bring that out for you and give you some insights on that if you're not sure ask other people I do find that it's easier that people write about the depth and they often don't write about the breadth and those who write more about the breadth are those who just provide the historical view they don't go deep if you will into any one topic and the area that you want to go deepest into are the topics, the concepts, or the issues related to your problem statement. The reason you're doing your dissertation literally is for you to collect data, to create information, to give to other people to lessen the problem. And if you think about it that way, then it might help you to include greater breadth and depth of the literature or the body of knowledge in your writing. What I want to do is share a little time here on how to present the relationships and the interrelationships of the topics, the concepts, or the themes that you wrote about up to this point. This section would come in after your final item. If you're writing about different 
stakeholders in a case study. If you're writing about specific things in a phenomenological study and you have already your 15 plus pages, maybe you already have 22 pages, 27 pages, as I mentioned before. The idea here is now you're going to write about relationships and interrelationships of all the content that you've already written about. And I like to look at it this way, that what you want to be able to do is show some connections and how one theme or one concept has something to do with another. If we're talking about nurse burnout, there's a relationship between the baby boomers, the number of baby boomers entering the healthcare system as they get older and the shortage of nurses. And we also see that there's a correlation that we start to see nursing burnout comes when there's nurses that are far more stressed out than they can handle. They leave, they retire, they resign to go work somewhere else in a less stressful situation. And so therefore we start to see there are these relationships and interrelationships between things that are actually occurring. One of the things I do like to see in this area is about four to ten pages. And this is going to depend on the complexity of your dissertation. But oftentimes, if you say that you're going to write about four to ten pages on showing relationships and interrelationships, you start to see that if you had 25 pages before of the content on the themes and the concepts, now you throw another four to ten pages and now you're easily over 30 pages. In most cases, I believe 30 pages is a good guide to go for as a minimum to produce a good chapter two. And this is 30 pages based on just the content. This does include the introduction, where you found all your sources as far as the history of finding where you found everything at, or the conclusion. This is just your pure content. All of a sudden you're well over 30 pages with your work. And I think that's what's important to realize that getting those 30 pages is not a big secret. It's not as hard as you think it is once you start to create your mind map and you start to create your timeline and put together your outline that all of a sudden 30 pages is not that challenging to be able to produce anymore. Again, remember, you can present this in a mind map and you can actually show the timeline. Oftentimes, dissertation chairs don't have a good understanding about the value of a mind map and a timeline. Again, every dissertation chair is a little bit different. I do believe that if nothing else, the timeline and the mind map is ideal for you to use to help you create your outline and then write to your outline. Oftentimes it, when people try to put in a mind map or a timeline, it doesn't fit well into a page in a published dissertation because a mind map may be too complex and by the time you shrink it down to fit in a page, it doesn't work very well. Remember, the mind map and the timeline are tools. And if they add value to your work and you can include it in there, that's fine. Oftentimes in a timeline, you can expand it and show different segments of time, like perhaps a 25 year period. Or if there's only a period from 1960 to 1980 that's of most important where these critical factors are, then just include that part of the timeline. You don't have to put the whole timeline from 1800 to the present day. Just put in the years and show what you want. Same thing with a mind map. You may want to only put the high level concepts and ideas into the mind map and not all the intricacies that come out there afterwards. I gave some great information in those two lessons about mind map and timeline. Again, if you haven't watched those yet, I encourage you to watch them and keep your pen and paper handy because I gave some pretty good tips on how you can do that and whether you should include it in your work or not. As always, with everything in your work, it's as you believe best. When you show these relationships and their relationships, you may have a different approach. But I think what's important here is that you have a section at the end of your chapter that talks about, or is written about, if you will, the relationships and interrelationships of the themes, of the different concepts that you wrote about. This is often the most important part of the chapter because this is what allows somebody else to get more value out of your work because it may be easy for people to understand what's the common pieces and what everybody else seems to know about or believe. But when you start to put these relationships and their relationships together, oftentimes by doing this, this is where you start to see gaps in the literature. You start to see gaps in what people are doing. We start to see that the problems continue on for certain reasons. And often it's because perhaps we get down to it. We're not training people correctly or we're not manning the 
nursing stations to the degree that we should with certain types of qualifications and perhaps even numbers of people. The example I'm sharing here is from one of my mentees that graduated a few years ago and his dissertation as his proposal was approved on the first pass through and why I believe why that's important is that it shows that he did a lot of work up front and he made sure that his work was developed well and it was sound and systematic and he had that good level of depth breadth, and suggested a systematic approach as you read through the chapter. He did give me his written consent to use his work. He owns the copyright on it. I only own the copyright on this program overall, but all the information from any of my mentees is a gift to me to be able to use to help other people. This example is from Dr. Dustin Pollack. His dissertation was published in 2011. It's titled A Phenomenological Study, The Influence of Professional Athletes' Unethical Behavior on Amateur Athletes. Here, Dr. Pollack started out this section after he provided the resources and where he found everything. He starts out with indicating chapter two consists of nine sections. Title search, historical overview, collegiate athletes' beliefs and influences, athletes as role models, athletes as performance enhancing subjects, ethical peer pressure on athletes, leadership impact, and gaps in the literature. Here you can see perhaps the design of his study. You can see how the chapter two began with the title searches where he got the information. He goes into then providing the historical overview. Then he went into providing all these different areas that he wrote about. So once he came up with these areas, it was easy for him to take this and basically create each one of these areas as a major heading in chapter two then he wrote his subheadings, perhaps as you would do under collegiate athletes' beliefs and influences. One subheading would have been beliefs, the other one would have been influences. Under the next area, he had athletes as role models. He gave different types of information about role models, good role models, poor role models, and just to fit the psychological perspective of how we look at people in positions of professional athletes. So you can start to see that once you look at this from a outline it becomes easier he went on to write the literature review chapter begins with a brief summary of the key words and phrases used to accomplish the literature review now if you're going to do a mind map it's not uncommon that what's in the mind map become these key words perhaps even key phrases or if you know the key words and key phrases you put that into your mind map and you start to see how building the mind map from these key words and phrases can also then start to suggest the relationships and interrelationships between them. Because once you see all these words in the physical form on a piece of paper, you start to see that you can create these mind maps. You can start to build the connections and you start to build and see the relationships and interrelationships. And I talk about that in the mind map lesson. So again, if you haven't watched that yet, please do. Then he goes and completes this paragraph with chapter two concludes with a discussion of the collegiate athletic beliefs, perceptions, and influences, and bias associated with the significance of athletic competition. Because this is a phenomenological study, a phenomenological study looks at lived experiences, and when we looked at lived experiences, those are often defined as what are one's assumptions, what are their beliefs, what are their perceptions, what are their values. These are the types of words that align well. So as I start to look here, we start to see how the design of his qualitative phenomenological study starts to even appear in chapter two, because in many cases, as I mentioned, the research method and design, particularly that design here is going to provide some sort of guidance, some sort of if you will, structure to how the chapter will be. Doesn't mean it's going to dominate the whole chapter, but here it's not uncommon that we would want to know about assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions, and values, perhaps, of anybody that's going to be interviewed for their lived experiences. Chapter 2, the only one that you can write, and write in in a manner that brings great credit upon yourself and the university you're graduating from.